Hi everyone, this is a tune from UMH, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Good morning and welcome to our online worship. We are glad you are here. Hi everyone, this is a tune from UMH. Great is thy faithfulness. This week I saw an ad for Christmas decorations. Uh, I went to Target and I was walking around buying Halloween candy and I noticed them setting up the red display towers where Christmas stuff is going to go and I already saw stockings on the shelves. And I thought to myself, we are in October. We're in October and I'm seeing Christmas stuff. That, that is bonkers. 
I feel like Christmas is creeping up earlier and earlier each year. Um, and as I think about Christmas and Halloween and decorations, I think <clears throat> decorations were never a problem for me until I got married. Mainly because nobody was ever at my house, so I never decorated anything. I never even painted the walls until my wife moved in, and I had lived there for five years. And the walls were a light pink. Not that there's anything wrong with pink, it's just a terrible color for all the walls in your home. But Amy loves to decorate for seasons and for holidays. Uh, she's a collector of knickknacks at heart. Deep down, she loves to co collect things. And so does anyone here know what target birds are? Does anyone collect target birds? Well, Amy loves target birds. They are these little bird dolls that are dressed up in different outfits. They kind of look like chickadees, but they put them in different costumes for Halloween and different fall colors for Thanksgiving and nutcracker uniforms and Santa jackets for Christmas. Each season has like five different ones each year, and Na Amy needs all of them. And so when the seasons change, Amy will take down the Halloween birds and put up the Thanksgiving ones, and the cycle just continues each year, and there's more and more birds added to the collection. Again, it's not bad. It's just I'm not a decorator, and it's just weird. Uh, the, changing, the changing of seasons is not something I've ever thought about before my mantle was covered in birds wearing costumes. And so what my problem is is how quickly stores move from season to season. It's October 24th. We should not be thinking about Christmas decorations. We still have Thanksgiving birds to set up before we even think about Christmas birds. But that's just an observation I had about society this week. Or maybe it's just living in capitalism. But our focus tends to shift rapidly. Uh, and this week is Halloween birds, and then... Next week will be Thanksgiving birds, then Christmas birds, then Valentine's birds, then St. Patrick's birds, then patriotic birds, and then we're already back to Halloween, all before the actual holidays happen. And our society seems to shift focus so quickly from one holiday to the next that if we went at the actual pace, we would never actually decorate our homes for anything because we'd be too busy switching them around. You know, if Amy put up the birds as soon as they'd be available... We would have all the birds up all year round all the time, and it would be a nightmare because when you walk over, knock over one of those dang things, all of them topple over. They're very unbalanced. And our society does this in a lot of ways. It does this with holiday decorations. Uh, the news is constantly doing this, churning up outrage after outrage where people react, get angry, and nothing gets done because the next thing has already happened. We see it in the different ways people have responded to the pandemic. Some people are still immunocompromised. Children can't be vaccinated. But some people in society decided that we needed to move forward. It feels as if our world is moving so fast that we don't actually have the time or the resources to care for the birds. Society and our world is so focused on moving ahead that we end up neglecting the people that don't have the resources or the ability to move forward with us. And to stop is to waste time. And to waste time is to waste money. And in our culture, that is the worst thing you can do. But this week, I see Jesus showing us a different story. When the crowd wants to move ahead, we see Jesus stop. And that's what I want us to hold as we move through this passage, this idea of the crowd already moving on, and how Jesus stops, and how priorities are reoriented so that people may experience healing. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus's son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show mercy on me. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet. But he shouted even louder, Son of David, 
show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, call him forward. They called the blind man, be encouraged, get up, he is calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. And immediately he was able to see and he began to follow Jesus on the way. For scripture in, among, and beyond us, thanks be to God. Now, if you're wondering if this text has been used recently because it sounds familiar, well, we actually used this text a few weeks ago uh, when we did Electio Divina. So if it feels like you just read it, we did. Great memory. Good job. But now, Selectio Divina is kind of this, just listen and see what comes up. And now we have the opportunity to really get into the text, to get, to dissect it, to take it apart, to see what is working through it. And so let's dissect it. And I think the first thing that we have to do is note some of the contextual realities that are present here. The first thing to note is where we're at in Jesus's journey. Jesus is still on the way to Jerusalem after the transfiguration. Jesus is heading straight for the cross. He knows what he has to do, and he's traveling up to Jerusalem, and people are coming alongside him. There were Pharisees coming up to Jesus, trying to test him about the law. There were little children coming up to Jesus. And a few weeks ago, we talked about the righteous man, the righteous rich man, whom Jesus told to go and sell everything and then to come and follow me. Now, this guy is particularly important in the story of Bartimaeus, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a moment. And so Jesus is on his way when he passes through Jericho. And Jericho is the last major stop before you go to Jerusalem. You know, it's the last place you, you have to use the bathroom, because once we leave Jericho, we're not stopping again until we get there. And scholars also believe that Jericho is where a lot of the temple priests live. And when they weren't actively working at the temple, they were staying in Jericho. So there was a lot of holy traffic between Jericho and Jerusalem as people came and went to work at the temple. And so it makes sense that as Jesus and his entourage are leaving Jericho, that this is where a blind beggar would be located. This is a primo spot. It's on a busy road. There's religious people walking back and forth who probably feel obligated to give alms. And the fact that people knew Bartimaeus' name probably meant that he was pretty well known. And so, as Bartimaeus sits in his usual spot, he can probably hear all of the commotion as this unique crowd moves through Jericho. And maybe he's been waiting all this time for Jesus to come through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. The words about Jesus had spread all over Israel, after all, that this Jesus guy was going around healing people. And it's at this moment that Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, begins making a ruckus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, Bart shouted. Immediately the crowd begins to shush Bartimaeus. They tell him to be quiet. It's fine if he wants to sit there quietly out of the way, but don't cause a scene and don't interrupt Jesus' journey. We are on a mission. We are on a journey. We don't have time to stop because after all, this is just Bartimaeus. He is just a marginalized beggar who is getting what he deserves. Because in Jesus' day, the belief was that if you were suffering from something like blindness, deafness, possession, or any sort of chronic pain, it was because of your sin. Or your parents' sin that was passed down to you. Bartimaeus is where he was supposed to be. He's supposed to be on the fringes of society, ignored by everyone, but a few priests, maybe. And he absolutely should not be causing a scene. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me! And Jesus stops. And Jesus calls him over. And then we see the crowd shift. Suddenly, Bartimaeus isn't this annoying, disruptive, blind beggar, but someone to cheer on as he runs toward Jesus. You see, the crowd wanted to move on and move past the marginalized voice in their community. Actually, the crowd was actively silencing 
the marginalized voice in their community. And the crowd is a lot like us. They don't want to deal with Halloween because Christmas is coming up. And we don't even want want to worry about Thanksgiving, but we see Jesus stops. And Jesus calls him. And so Bartimaeus throws aside his cloak. He probably doesn't have a lot of possessions, and your coat is very important, especially if you're a beggar, but he throws it aside. He runs to Jesus, and Jesus asks him, What do you want? And Bartimaeus knows what he wants. He wants to see. Rabbi, I want to see. Jesus tells him to go. His faith has healed him. And immediately Bartimaeus begins following Jesus. Now let's pause here a moment, because Mark, our author, is doing something significant with this story. Mark is disrupting the status quo of Jesus' day and of Mark's day, especially when we juxtapose this story of Bartimaeus with the story of the rich man who also came up to Jesus. Because the story of the rich man is a story about a righteous person who keeps all of God's commandments coming to Jesus and asking what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus tells him, Jesus tells him to sell all of his possessions, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. The rich man leaves with his head down, unable to do what Jesus asked of him. And then we have Bart. This blind beggar who was suffering because of his sin, he was on the fringes of society and it was where he belonged, yet Bartimaeus is the one who has the faith to cry out to Jesus. And Jesus stops. Jesus heals him and Bartimaeus is the one who does not need to be told to leave things behind. He already threw his cloak to the side. He let go of the things that hold him to the systems that the crowd is invested in. Then Jesus tells him to go, and Bartimaeus immediately begins following Jesus. He doesn't go back for his cloak. He doesn't go visit anyone. He doesn't. He just begins following. It's the blind beggar, not the righteous man. It's the person marginalized by society, not the successful person. It's Bartimaeus, not the rich person, who gets it. It's the ones who are on the fringes of society that understand what it means to be in God's kingdom. Bartimaeus could have easily been quiet. He could have thought that Jesus would not care about a blind man begging on the side of the road. Bartimaeus could have chosen to remain in blindness and darkness for the rest of his life, but when he heard about Jesus, when he heard that Jesus' ministry was centered around love and forgiveness, Bartimaeus had the faith and the courage to ask for the healing that he required. And that is where I think we can come into this story. We've looked at this text. We understand and see the comparisons Mark is making between the rich person and Bartimaeus. We understand the context of where Jesus is at in the gospel story and also where Jesus is at physically in his journey through Jericho. And now after understanding all this work that we just did, we can ask the question, where do we fit into this story? Where do we find ourselves in this story? Are we the disciples following after Jesus, trying to learn and deepen our understanding of his mission and God's kingdom? Are we the crowd? Are we participating in the systems that are actively harming and marginalizing folks, even while trying to follow Jesus? Or are we Bartimaeus? Are we suffering? Are we choosing to live in the darkness, afraid to ask for healing? This last weekend, Amy threw a Halloween gathering. Uh, She had some friends come over and we watched some scary movies outside on our little projector and screen. And as we were getting the house ready, you know, cleaning the bathrooms, doing the dishes, vacuuming, it made me realize that Amy and I have really grown mature as a couple. Because when I look back, I can see there's, there's two different types of people when it comes to cleaning a house. The planner and the panicker. Now, I've always kind of been a planner. You know, I add smaller cleaning tasks to my to-do list each day of the week, so that by the time the party comes at the end of the week, I don't have any big cleaning tasks to do. Uh, I don't always follow through, but that's generally how I try to do things. And Amy and I have gotten pretty good at this. You know, I think it comes with experience. However, Amy and I used to be panickers. Maybe you're this way. 
or maybe your mother was. But a person who is a panic cleaner will wait to do everything on the last day and then have a meltdown over things not being clean. It's like, imagine you got a call from your mother or somebody you respect out of the blue saying, we're going to be there in 15 minutes and there's clumps of dust on the floor and stacks of dishes in the sink and toothpaste shrapnel all over the bathroom mirror and you go into overdrive. If you've ever told a, a panic cleaner to calm down, you've probably had your head bitten off. And when Amy and I were both panic cleaners at the beginning of our marriage, you know, we would just feed off of each other and end up screaming and then apologizing 15 minutes later. But we're better now, and I realized that as I was cleaning my house this week. But that's what happens when you live with someone, right? You figure out better ways to do things. We also had someone staying with, the, with us this weekend, and unprompted, Amy and I prepared the room in our own ways. You know, the guest room is also her art room, so she cleaned off the bed from her art supplies, and I do the laundry, so I made sure there was fresh sheets on the bed, and then I cleaned the bathroom, and Amy prepped dinner, and we, we began our marriage as anxious, panicking individuals, but we've grown into a partnership that anticipates the other's needs and knows how to communicate what we want. The journey wasn't easy. You know, we had to, to yell and scream and panic and, and melt down. And then we also had to let go of a lot of things and throw aside a lot of habits that we've inherited growing up, some of which we may never shake, but then we just get the opportunity to offer grace when the other messes up. And I think the story of Bartimaeus is a perfect example of this because this it's how we operate when people come over. We want to clean our whole house so that nobody knows that we sometimes have dust bunnies sitting in corners and dirty dishes that get left for days or we leave our shoes out and clothes on the floor. And when we know that the person who is coming is Jesus, we take extra steps. Prepare the best room. Get the cleanest towels. What time of year is it? October? Light the pumpkin spice candle in the guest room. Throw all the cardboard we've been too lazy to recycle in the garage. Close the basement door to the room that still has all the boxes we never unpacked when we moved in three years ago. We're like the rich guy that came to Jesus. We think we need to have it all figured out. Our houses have to be spotless and clean and in order before Jesus would ever step foot in it. But Jesus doesn't want to just visit your house. Jesus wants to move in. Jesus wants to move in. He wants to help transform your life from panic and anxiety into one filled with faith. He wants, to use, he wants us to be like Bartimaeus. He wants us to leave all that stuff behind and ask for healing. He wants to let go of the status quo and immediately follow him. Several years ago, I was in a worship at an Anglican church in Kentucky, and the pastor that day asked the people in attendance to give Jesus the deed to their house. Because Jesus wants to help fix that leak in the basement. Jesus wants to help you take the pipe off the sink when your ring falls down the drain at 1 a.m. Jesus wants to help you unpack and organize the boxes you haven't been able to open. Give Jesus the deed to the house. And you might be sitting there thinking, Jesus does not care what I have or what I'm doing. Jesus only cares about important things. Stop. Jesus stopped. Jesus called to Bartimaeus. Jesus healed Bartimaeus. Jesus cares. And of course, this house is a metaphor for our lives. And our lives are more than just our stuff. We are a spirit. We are a heart. We are a mind. And we are a body. That is what Jesus calls us to love with, our spirit, our heart, our mind, and our body. So let me ask you, where do you need to be like Bartimaeus and call out to Jesus for healing? Do you need healing in your spirit after dealing with a year away from worship? Do you need healing in your heart after seeing the devastation in our world? Do you need healing in your mind as you try to process everything going on? Do you need healing in your body? as your body tries to keep up and maintain in the midst of all this stress. Where are you experiencing blindness? Where do you need to ask for sight? Go, said Jesus.
Your faith has healed you. And immediately Bartimaeus received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. My friends, I pray that we would experience the same faith and courage that Bartimaeus showed us that day. I pray that we would ask for healing when we need it. I pray that we will give Jesus the deed to our house and follow after him. Amen. Hi everyone, this is a tune from UMH, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you for joining us for worship today. God bless you. The Spirit fill you. Christ go with you and you with Christ always and everywhere. Go in peace. Amen.